Hey guys, Tom here from the Investing with Tom YouTube channel. Welcome back to the channel. If you enjoy today's video, hit like, hit subscribe, and that way you can see future videos as well. So uh, before we get into today's video, uh, the new numbers for New Zealand are probably going to be out um, for today by the time I release this video. But nonetheless, I just wanted to say very well done to everyone in New Zealand. We've had two days in a row now with zero new cases. You guys know what I'm talking about. Spicy meat. <laughs> yeah, boy. With that said, let's get into the video. So one of my favorite investors of all time is Monish Parai, as, as many of you will know. And probably the, my favorite talk that he's ever given is a talk called the 10 Commandments of Investment Management, where he basically lays out his 10 fundamental guidelines on being a great investor. Uh, it is sort of targeted at people that manage money professionally. So there are a couple of points that uh, are probably not as applicable uh, to the individual investor like like you and me are likely to be. Um, but even those ones, I think we can get something out of them if you're looking to invest in index funds and ETFs and that sort of thing. So um, this is going to be the first of a two part video. There are 10 points and I want to get into at least a reasonable level of detail with each of them. So uh, this will be the first five and you'll have to keep an eye out for part two of this video as well. Uh, but without further ado, let's get into it. Now the first commandment from Monish Pabrai and I'll leave a link to uh, the full talk. Uh, it's a couple of hours long so I'll also leave the link to an article if you just want to kind of read the 10 points and get the basics out of it. I'll leave links to both of those in the description. But the first point uh, is thou shall not skim off the top and this is one that I'm not going to spend too much time on because I've actually already done a full video on it uh, which I'll leave a link to up on the screen here somewhere. Uh, but thou shall not skim off the top is essentially a point that relates to Monus Probri's fee structure in his uh, investment fund. And for the typical mutual fund or hedge fund, um, they charge horrendously high fees and that can do real damage to the actual investor in those funds. So a very typical way of setting that up is something like a two and 20. So you take 2% uh, just for breathing as Warren Buffett would call it. So 2% a year uh, just as a management fee. And then you have a 20% performance fee. So um, any gains that that investor made, you would take 20% of those profits. And the numbers just can get insane, especially if you've got a very large team, um, you might need some really big fees to pay those people. Uh, Monish Probri works on his own and it allows him to have a fee structure which aligns very well with investors. So um, he basically charges zero management fee, um, performance only, and he doesn't even take any performance fees until he returns at least 6% per year to investors. So over and above that, he takes a quarter of any gains. Uh, and that's a model that he's cloned from the original Buffett partnerships actually. So um, very cool fee structure. As Monus Pry himself has said, the economics of managing money at scale can get pretty insane. Um, so he can afford a few lean years, <laughs> as he'd put it, by uh, having no, no management fee so that in poor years he, he basically gets paid nothing. You know, just to give you an example, Monus Pry manages right around a billion dollars, maybe slightly less. Um, but let's say he manages a billion dollars and he has a really good year and makes 20% returns. Um, that means he has that first 6% where he pays no, um, gets paid nothing basically. Over and above that, he's made an extra 14% and he gets 14, he gets a quarter of that. So uh, a quarter of 14% is 3.5% and 3.5% of a billion dollars is about $35 million. So if he can produce a 25% return uh, or a 20% return rather, he's up for a payday of $35 million for that year. So if you only have that once every few years and you have basically no costs like Pabri does, um, that's an extremely lucrative model, uh, even with those much lower fees than, than the average hedge fund, which has to pay thousands of people and it just kind of hurts the investor. So that's commandment number one. Uh, and like I said, I'll leave a link to the video. So go check that out if you're interested in the actual numbers behind um, some of Pabri's fees. And let's get into commandment number two. So commandment number two actually kind of ties into the first one and it's thou shall not have an investment team. So Monish Pabrai very much believes that investing is an individual pursuit. Um, he certainly has people like Guy Spear and so on that he bounces ideas back and forth off. Um, but he, he basically works alone. And again, it's something he's cloned from Warren Buffett. He of course has Charlie Munger to bounce ideas off, but largely he's working 
uh, autonomously, basically on, on his own the, the whole time when he's researching companies. And even often if Charlie Munger disagrees with him on an investment idea, um, he's got a pretty long history of going ahead and doing it anyway if he thinks something's a good idea. So um, an investment team, as Monish Prabhai puts it, uh, in a lot of ways is an oxymoron. Uh, you know, he gives the example of if he were to employ some young, smart analyst, um, he'd be getting good good investment ideas left, right and center. And pretty much all the research shows that your performance in your portfolio will perform much, much better um, the less changes that you make to that portfolio. So Monish Prabhai has a goal of only finding one to two investments per year, much like myself. That's where I got that idea from. Um, so he doesn't need a team of analysts to keep bringing him ideas. He's very open to getting investment ideas from other places, um, but it's not a necessity. So that's kind of the first main benefit of not having an investment team. The second actually ties back to our first commandment. So if Pabri does not have a team of 20 analysts and you know big tall office buildings in New York or whatever, um, he keeps his expenses in his hedge fund very low and it basically allows him to get away with lower fees. You know, he um, probably has something like, you know, half a million dollars of um, costs to run his business. I'm pretty sure that's about the number he's, he's said. Uh, and, you know, in a good year, he's making $30 million. So that's very profitable, obviously. But if he were investing, if, if he had a team of like 10 analysts that are each on $200,000 a year or more, um, the cost can blow out a little bit. Um, and, you know, it's it's probably not going to add any investment returns, as Pabri has already said. Uh, it's only going to add fees. Uh, it's going to make Pabri either less profitable or it's going to make him have to charge um, higher investment rates on his um, to, to his investors who are going to, at the end of the day, be worse off as well. So uh, commandment number two, thou shall not have an investment team. So commandment number three is that thou shall accept that I'll be wrong at least one third of the time. And... Uh, you know, investing is a great business for a number of reasons, and one of the really good things about it is you can make um, you can make mistakes and still do very well. So uh, even if you're only right two thirds of the time or half of the time when you make investment decisions, uh, you know, often when you make mistakes, you can actually get uh, a lot of your money back, if not all of your money back, or even make a small gain. Uh, that's obviously not the goal all the time, is just purely to get your money back. We obviously want to make a return, um, but it's a great business in that way. And John Templeton has told us that, you know, even the very best investment analysts will be wrong every now and then. Um, we've seen it with Warren Buffett, we've seen it with Monus Prabhai, we've seen it with Charlie Munger, we've seen it with pretty much every investor under the sun, uh, myself included, that no matter how much you research, um, investing is a game of probabilities in a lot of ways, and you're you're flat out going to be wrong um, every now and then, and you're probably going to be wrong quite frequently as well. Um, but if you make, um, you know, as prudent a decisions as you can with every investment that comes across your table, um, over the long run, you should do well. Um, you will make a lot of mistakes. You have to accept them. Uh, it's part of the game, but even with a lot of mistakes, you can still do quite well. So commandment number four is thou shall look for a hidden PE of one stocks. And uh, this is a concept that Pabri has actually become quite well known for. And it's something that's worked very successfully for him um, in the past and in quite recent times as well. And basically what, that, what a hidden PE of one means, so obviously we know that a PE of one means that if a company is selling for $100 million, they're also earning $100 million in that year. So it's relative to their current earnings, it's an extremely cheap business. Um, now, what Pabri is looking for is not necessarily a PE of one. If you can find, you can't just go into a stock screener and look for the lowest PE, find a PE of one and buy it. Often there's very, very good reasons <laughs> that companies will trade that cheaply. Uh, generally, if they're trading at a PE of one or two, they quite have quite a high risk of going bankrupt. Going bankrupt if there's not some, you know, other reason that, that you can dig into and figure out that actually they've just mispriced this thing and the, the market has sort of made a mistake. So... Um, often there's very good reasons that, that businesses trade at a very, very low PE. Um, and that's not necessarily what Pabri is talking about here. When he says he's looking for a hidden PE of one, he's often looking at where the business can be in two or three or five or, or, or so years. Um, you know, he brings up the example of Fiat Chrysler, which 
um, in the last couple of years has actually had some you know significant declines in the stock price which has made this investment look um, slightly less spectacular than it than it initially did but it was still a phenomenal investment um, you know Pabri bought into Fiat Chrysler uh, I think in around 2012-2013 when uh, the stock was trading for about five dollars a share and Fiat Chrysler at the time were um, being run by Sergio Marchione and he had a business plan in place where he uh, expected Fiat Chrysler to actually earn five dollars a share uh, in around 2018-2019 kind of kind of time um, and that happened so um, not only did um, he get like a 5x on his Fiat Chrysler shares because um, they ended up trading at about five times earnings with you know a massive growth in earnings when they got to um, when they when they got to that target that Sergio set um, but they also spun off Ferrari. He got, um, you know, several Ferrari shares, uh, made lots and lots of money on that, even though he sold far earlier than he should have. And they've also paid out big dividends and special dividends uh, right along the way. And he's made a lot of money from that investment. So those are the type of stocks that Pabri absolutely loves. Um, he had a lot of room to capture upside because he was paying uh, a pretty cheap price even on 2012, 2013 earnings extremely cheap like ridiculously low impossibly low price if they actually executed on that plan so there was a lot of room for upside uh, but the fact that he brought it so cheaply um, and they had you know relatively cons modest kind of levels of debt and so on uh, meant that the downside was also very limited as well so look for hidden PE of one stocks so that is commandment number four now commandment number five and the last one that I want to touch on today um, is actually one that I really really like and you might be surprised that I like it based on some of the videos that you've seen on this channel um, and that is thou shall never use Excel. Um, you've obviously seen me walk through various Excel you know discounted cash flows and so on on this channel to arrive at intrinsic value um, but I actually really really like this point. So what Pabri is basically trying to say here is if you can't run a valuation, uh, if you can't tell that a business is extremely undervalued, um, you know, on your hands and fingers or in your head, um, quite quickly, it's still probably not cheap enough. And I think that's a great mindset to have. Um, you know, many of us are not extreme, math, extremely good mathematicians or anything. I like to think I'm pretty good and I can run a lot of numbers in my head as well. Um, so it's a great mindset to have, you know, if something doesn't jump off the screen at me when I'm, when I'm looking through some basic numbers as being like unbelievably cheap, uh, I usually continue on to the next company and keep, keep digging. So, uh, that's a phenomenal rule for me. If, um, you know, if we take the Fiat Chrysler example again, if we can buy them for $5 a share and we expect them to be earning $5 per share in, in four or five years, uh, we don't need an Excel spreadsheet to tell us that that's cheap, assuming they can execute on that plan. So thou shall not use Excel. Uh, that is commandment number five. And that's where we're going to leave it today. So keep an eye out for part two of this video. Uh, that will be the next video that is up on the channel after this one, where we will get through commandments six through 10 uh, from Monish Pabri. So hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, hit like, hit subscribe. You can watch some older videos over there. Hit subscribe over there. Otherwise, I will see you in the next one. Cheers.